think we're about to kick off. Our first speaker this morning was um, stuck in traffic, so he may, be, may well be zooming in. Um, I'm just going to give you a little introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. My name is Jonathan Bloor. I'm a low carbon Devon research fellow at the University of Plymouth. Um, we've been on this ERDF project now for about 18 months to two years. And my original role was uh, to understand solar energy largely. So, um, but welcome to everyone that's come. There's a bunch of people online. And um, yeah, thanks for making the effort. Um, we don't have any fire alarms planned, so if you do hear an alarm, we've got fire exits back and front. Uh, bathrooms are just out the back and then straight up the centre of the building. You'll find a central area there, so that's all housekeeping. So exploring green hydrogen. Well, there's something that I didn't know much about at the beginning of this project. So um, here's a little quiz for you. <laughs> when I when I was like green hydrogen, what do you mean by green hydrogen? So these are the these are the forms of hydrogen that exist, as far as I'm aware. This may grow and change as techniques move on. Now, um, I think most of us are familiar with grey hydrogen, if uh, and that's usually um, when you're using uh, methane in a steam reforming. Uh, context that's how we get gray hydrogen now i think most of our hydrogen in the world at the moment is produced in this method and it produces greenhouse gases so hence our focus today on green hydrogen um anyone else got any hydrogen guesses oh someone's joined no the computer says no um blue hydrogen anyone please <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we have a correct, yeah, yeah, and so, and so, I think the three most important ones green, blue, and gray. Now, as I say, gray steam methane reforming is the process, um, blue, it's the same process but with carbon capture and storage CCS, which, um. I don't know the e efficacy of that currently. Exactly, exactly, thank you. So we make about 70 million tonnes of hydrogen every year. Um, and if uh, and most of that is used for making fertilisers. Um, and so if we did produce all of that by a green method, we'd probably save about 1.6% of total greenhouse gases emitted, which, you know, is a start, but that's just for replacing what we already do with grey hydrogen. So, um, and, you know, I'll send out these slides, but there's some interesting ones at the bottom, pink and white and stuff like that. So the great thing about green hydrogen for me is that well, what I think is that, it, you know, you can take electricity, renewable electricity, you can store it, and then you can use it again later, you know. Uh, and we all thought maybe batteries would do this, and they will play a part in this, but I, I really see, I think my eyes have been opened a little bit, and I see it as um, an energy storage vector, really, on our journey to net zero. It's, it's a part of the solution, so... So however you might feel about it, this is what today's really all about and exploring it. So um, what's next? Oh, so yeah, so this is where we started. Let's go back to the beginning. So Adrian's here today, one of my supervisors. So we, we started to study on uh, vertical solar power across the university, a little setup on one of the roofs here. Um, uh, just to understand the efficacy of what happens when you put a vertical panel in an urban environment. And I've got a couple of uh, research projects going across Devon, not just here at the university. So I had to set this up and then I also had to understand uh, how to get the data from these individual panels, uh, visualize these things, see things in real time. And this also made me think about renewable energy generation, connecting to the grid, grid constraints, all those issues that we uh, maybe 
sort of aware of, maybe not aware of, but they are issues. So uh, I knew that there had to be something in between large offshore renewable energy production or something like that and and um, and our usage. Uh, and we all want to, you know, we all thought maybe, well, batteries are there, but that, that's just one of the solutions. So, so it got me interested in uh, visualization of, uh, energy generation and this is just a little snapshot of uh, open source dashboards that I had to play with and you know data pipelines and things like that so so yeah so understanding when something's being generated where can we direct it will it go straight into the grid grid can't handle it grid can't handle it in the southwest or something like that will it go into another energy storage vector which I hope green hydrogen to be so um yeah so that's a little bit about me uh and i suppose an outline of what i think green hydrogen will be but again today's a little bit about exploring that so we've got a number of speakers uh I'm very happy with myself at the back of a solar panel welcome uh oh jack yeah jack's there where is he oh there he is look and he's in the audience too so it's a real thing um uh i've forgotten about sorry jack um and we get some promising indicators around vertical solar in an urban environment so it's not not to write that off um our first speaker is is um well there was a uh, i've got a thumbs up i think he's joining us from online is that can we hear you um phil yeah i'm here hey awesome right <laughs> So uh, Michelle Hitches and Phil Johnson, uh, they actually had a, a green hydrogen event yesterday in Falmouth. Is this correct? Now, I didn't hear about this until about four days ago. So quickly contacted them and they've kindly decided to come up and, and, and speak here too. So um, Michelle Hitches is a senior project manager for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and Flow Accelerator. Is that correct? Um, we'll, we'll talk about that later. And then Phil, um, who was previously an environmental scientist, uh, is now um, a consultant working on the strategic development of uh, floating offshore wind in uh, Celtic Sea Power. So Phil's up first, and then we'll seamlessly transition into Michelle, if that's okay. Are you there, Phil? I'm here, yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, so um, I'm your clicker man. So next slide, and away we go. Great. Now, I, I should I should say I didn't manage to make the uh, the event yesterday either, but uh, Michelle's far more uh, qualified oh. than I am. But if I, <laughs> if I if I set the scene from somewhere on the A three A eight in the back end of my car, um, and then I'm sure Michelle can pick up on on technical stuff as well. Um, but yeah, it's just to give a flavour of floating offshore wind where it's at. I'm aware that you know it's increasing people are increasingly aware of it, but it is happening at pace and and real scale. So it's just to kind of give a, a thumbnail of that if, if people aren't aware, uh, and obviously if you are, then we're happy to happy to take questions. Um, and also a little bit about what we're trying to do from the regional perspective to make it to make sure the benefits uh, are derived to, to um, Cornwall, uh, Devon and the wider southwest of South Wales. So uh, next slide, if you would, Johnny. Sure. So it's just a, a quick, uh, a quick synopsis of what we do at Kelsey Sea Power, because we're slightly, we're slightly unusual uh, fish, really. Uh, we're, we're holding on by Cornwall Council and we got lucky, really. It's a bit of a mix of fortune and foresight, but um, the sale of the old wave hub site to, to, to Hexagon as a floating wind developer, Put money in the council's coffers, as did an ERDF project and also a legacy project in Pembroke. So that that meant we were well placed um, and seeing the sort of flow market coming to start to plan for it from a regional perspective. So we we kind of we happy to you know we've we taken up the role to lead it. There's an element of accelerating that flow development initially alongside maximising it and benefit to the region, but, but that's fallen away now. It is accelerating itself. If anything, it's about maybe maybe sort of like temper the pace so we can make sure that we do it in the right way. Um, so we're not sort of a sub subsidiary of Cornwall Council. Uh, with a few projects under our belt, but I won't dwell on that. So next slide, I think this is all, also a dummy slide, really. I think I don't think anyone's under any any um, uh, illusions of the, the crisis we're in for, for, uh, for, for energy for the UK. It's a, it's a, a security crisis. It's a, it's a net zero crisis. Um, and this is all before Ukraine. So this is a slide that should be familiar to all. But so happy to move on briskly from that. 
Uh, yeah, and the next one, if you would, and again, quite quite a fairly simple slide. So I'll breeze through through these uh, these slides and and um, let you pepper with any questions. But just just to bit you up to speed, really, is flow is is a marriage between two known technologies, which which puts it, which makes which gives a lot more confidence in its in its um uh, in its uh, feasibility. It's not there yet by any means, but it brings together the 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 energy generation bit, the turbines, which is which is obviously very well known, albeit now at a huge scale. And the the uh, platforms, the, the the floating structure that float, which primarily from the gas industry, putting them two together makes them a lot, you know, a lot more. There's a lot more confidence in them, but there's still a lot of work to do on the technology. There's no doubt about it. And also the scalability of it is 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 in incredible. So we're looking at turbines. I think I think I saw. And I think there's been a one man out from China. I think it was 18 megawatts. I saw this morning. Um, you know that that sort of level, um, height potentially height challenging at the height of the Eiffel Tower. On a, on a platform about about the uh, about the shape of size and shape of a football field, uh, but with with several thousand more tons of concrete and steel involved, so it's it's a hefty structure, and we're looking at putting around 250, 260 of these structures out in the Celtic Sea um, in the next 10 years or so. Um, so that's uh, that's that's based on the on the on the about the total sea from Celtic Sea. So that that's what it is, and this is all opened up. Should to underline. It's come on the Celtic Sea like a rocket because this technology opens up deeper areas. It is moored to the seabed, should say, but unlike fixed offshore wind, um, you, know, you can put it in deeper, deep, much deeper water, which which we have uh, in the area between Cornwall, uh, Wales, and out to Wales Islands. So, move on to the next slide, if you would, Johnny. Sure. And again, and it, it's a sign of my it's it's a sign of well, partly my tardiness with with updating slides, and also the pace of pace of change. This this slide is is updated, and it's only from July. This has since been updated, so I must I must. Uh, Slap on the wrist there for me, but essentially it's the Crown Estate. Um, it's their seabed owning the process, um, uh, issuing issuing updates to developers, of which we have at least 24, 25 prospecting. Um, although I think I think that that may be, you know, that's a mix of, of big uh, big guys, big you know, oil and gas majors, formerly oil and gas energy majors, and smaller uh, prospectors. But um, you know, it's it's a very very healthy market. So the Crown Estate control that process of of uh, leasing the seabed. So. This is part of their winnowing down of, of, of where suitable areas are, although there, there are a lot of marine spatial planners involved in this, and, and we, we have a program that through the uh, call for flow accelerator. But that's the target, four gigawatts by 2035, and uh, looking at 20 gigawatts around about by 2045. So this is, this is uh, you know, an immense amount of energy. I guess that's the key point to get across to this this room here is the, in terms of renewable energy coming online, obviously huge implications for the grid, and how that how that energy is transported and whether the hydrogen the role hydrogen has to play in that and um, but this is these are the numbers we're talking about in a short space of time and the next slide i think we can move through the next few fairly crispy if that's okay johnny mm -hmm. um, that, that one so, oh, <laughs> that's okay that's a bit too, that's a bit too crispy for me but that's okay um <laughs> do, do tell me to slow down i know it, no it, no no speed up <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so and it's real. I mean, just just underline it. It's very real. Hexagon won their won their CFD um, in the summer, so this will be happening. The first Celtic uh, Celtic Sea uh, floating offshore wind site will happen. It's a test and demo site for thirty two megawatts, which is looking like small small fry suddenly, um, but that will happen off hail, and, and we're involved in supporting that on our on our old Wave Hub site, which is where we we, uh, we came from. So. But the key to that is it, it's, it makes it real. It, it, it helps focus most of the you know, political uh, elements and also um, stimulate supply chain. There's a lot of questions around that, rooting that in. These first test and demo sites, uh, you know, are not necessarily indicative of the bigger of the bigger platforms to come, um, but they obviously are a key a key element, the stepping stones. But um, you know, 32 megawatts is it, you know a few years ago that it felt like a really serious site, but but now it's 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 actually really small and it'll have to that whole and it will scale up very rapidly. I think just mentioned as well on this slide is that this, this design uh, of Hexagon's design is atypical. The twin hub design is atypical, um, but that it does also, you know, suggest that there are many designs, a lot of the technology is forming. There's a lot of sort of slightly academic debate about whether the structures will be will be concrete or steel, uh, you know, what the kind of moorings will be. I think there'll be more variation myself. Um, and also I think there's huge potential for the use of concrete um, in from the region, which has massive implications for local content. I'm happy to, to go to the next few slides, which is an animation. So am I um, sure. on your speaker, Johnny? Yeah, go Again, for it. Again, just to accelerate the scale, place, and also uh, scale it in the place, so it's your location. So hopefully you can see on that map off the test your geography, north of the, the West Cornwall there, you've got a little blip that's the hexagon site. 
So that's all ready to go. That's the twin hub site of, of 32 megawatts. And then if you click the next one, we'll see the next few uh, test and demo sites come online. That's clear, White Cross, uh, the flotation team, and Simply Lou, you may have heard about as well with the Erebus team. Um, so they, they, they are very much in the vanguard and they are very likely to happen and put about, I think, half, half a gigawatt within the next few years. I think the 2027 date is probably a little bit loose, but certainly by, by late 2020s. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the next one, we're looking at by 2030, pre-commercial, you know, we're looking at gigawatt of power coming ashore mm -hmm. somewhere, being handled by the grid somehow. Um, and again, you know, not six months, certainly a year ago, there wasn't a great deal of confidence to have a gigawatt by 2030, but now it, it's taken for granted. You know, we, we feel very confident we can what we're coming on, on, on shore somehow and somewhere. So, and you can see the numbers there. Indicative, I, I know that's drawn from the catapult from a couple of years ago, those numbers there about uh, jobs and GVA, but, you know, the potential for the region that the flow is, is really significant. And then we move slightly further beyond there, 2035, not so far away. Um, the, the where, where their place is indicative, you know, we saw the areas of search earlier, which needs refining. We shall see where they where they're placed, but there's a fair amount of work work to do with making sure marine users are, are, are engaged and 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 uh, consulting all that sort of stuff, fisheries, shipping lane, military, all that kind of stuff. There's still work to do, but it's it's uh, it's 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 coming down. It's becoming clearer, but uh, we can expect a fair sweep in that in that broad area. And then moving on, I think it's also the next couple of slides just to show that potential really. Uh, mm. 20 gigawatts for 2045 has been stated by a target, but there's a lot of wind out there. So, um, you know, there's, there's, I think, I think I know that one study suggested 80 gigawatts is perfectly achievable with marine spatial planning, uh, which is obviously key to it. Um, and that, you know, we're suddenly over the UK's um, current energy demand. So, it, you know, potentially puts the, the UK in the region in a position of being an energy exporter. Uh, which again, I'm sure has got. Uh, we should, I'm sure, we'll, we'll we'll prompt questions amongst amongst you guys who know about hydrogen. But how on earth we're going to do that? And I think that starts to to wrap me up, except to mention the Kelsey cluster. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a, a regional initiative. Um, the Catapult, uh, Michelle, myself, and Kelsey Power, and others are um, from those organisations were involved alongside the Cornwall LEP, um, you know, Wales, and the Welsh government, crucially. So it's, it's public sector steered for, for, for now, and that's setting up really, really a broad church to represent the region's interest. There's a, a strategy out recently, um, which happy to send to anyone interested, but it, it sets the tone. We're, we're, we're lucky, I think, and a, a bit of foresight to say, you know, this, this opportunity is coming to the region. A lot of developers are prospecting, uh, a lot of money to be made, but actually it's a strong regional voice that, that provides a dynamic between the, that sort of wind industry and central government. Um, is is, is going to be really key to, to make sure we we, we do this in, in, in a good in a in a good way. So just to fly the flag for the cluster, and if you're if you're a company in the region, uh, do sign up to that. And there's uh, in time it will become you know there'll be a supply chain list and the various benefits to, to be involved in that. Um, and lastly, if you're Cornish, just a plug for our Cornwall Flow Accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can you can do, do get in some touch because there's a few things we can offer you through our ERDF program. But I won't I won't sell that too hard before before Michelle picks up. Brilliant. Thanks, um, Phil. That's really great. Um, thanks for zooming in. <laughs> Hope you're not uh, overly uh, trapped in the traffic there and you can get back. Um, it's a great, yeah, great opening uh, for, for us to understand where where is all this renewable energy going to come from? And it seems like there's going to be a lot um, in the pipeline. So thanks very much again. Um, uh, and up our next speaker is Michelle Hitches, which will tie into the hydrogen side of things. There we go, Michelle. Hi everybody, thank you for having me. I'm Michelle Hitches. I'm Senior Project Manager at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, part of my remit is looking after all of our future energy systems projects and our floating offshore wind projects, um, which is quite nice because obviously they're going to fit straight into each other. So yeah, Phil's given us a great introduction about flow and where it's all going to come from. But you know, as I stand here today, we've got about 11 gigawatts of um, wind, um, offshore wind out there now, and it's curtailed because there's actually nowhere for all of that energy to go at any given time. So that's where we see hydrogen coming into the picture. Um, as offshore new energy catapult, we obviously only concentrate on um, green hydrogen because that's what um, 
you know, it's what we stand for. So today I'm just going to give you a little overview of a couple of the projects that we run, um, just to see some of the technology that's come forward and how we're supporting the innovation. So our first project is the Milford Haven Energy Kingdom project. This is the Milford Haven Waterway, very close to my heart because I live just around the corner from there. Um, but as you can see, it is a great resource there. Um, why did we pick the Milford Haven Waterway? It's the, the port is the UK's leading energy port in the UK, and it, it deals with over um, 300 tonnes of cargo every year. It's a massive port. So the Energy Kingdom project was about gathering a detailed insight and a whole energy system design for um, the port and the local area. So I'll show you later on um, the boundary and what we've done. If you speak to anybody about our project, they'll speak to you about the demonstrators, what they can see on the ground, even though the project is much bigger than that. So here we've got our transport demonstrator. So um, on the Milford Haven Marina, actually on the sea or the quay side, um, we've got a um, green electrolysis system being fed from the solar panels at the port and it's literally in a shipping container. So unfortunately, we've just started this project, COVID hit, so we had to completely change the way we were gonna design our system. So luckily we had a company called Fuel Cell Systems, who are very innovative. So we designed our system so that all the electrolyzers, the compressors and the storage could all fit into a shipping container. So that is on the sea side and it's behind the um, hydrogen refueler there. And then that's the high speed then that fills the River Simple Raza car. So we picked the River Simple Raza car, one, because it's Welsh, because we wanted to keep it in region. Two, it's lightweight. Um, and three, it's an electric fuel cell car powered by hydrogen. They've got a mobility as a service model, so they'll never ever sell a car. So you'll buy it, you'll have it on lease, sorry, and all your hydrogen will be included in that cost, your tires, your MOT, everything. Then you'll give it back to them. They'll pull the car apart. They'll recycle all the parts and make new cars. So just looking at the circular economy aspect of um, keeping everything going. So this is our system that we've got. This is our um, hybrid heating system. Sorry, my slides are slightly different to yesterday's, so I'm slightly out of the sink. Um, so the other, um, the other trial we had was the hybrid heating system. So here we had an air source heat pump with a normal conventional boiler, but with smart controls. So the um, smart controls will switch between the heat pump and the boiler and deliver the heat with the lowest possible carbon emissions. So here we did um, two world first trials. We did one with an 80-20 hydrogen mix, which we could use the conventional boiler for. And then we swapped it out for a Worcester Bosch um, brand new 100% hydrogen boiler and did that too. And that meant that we didn't have to change any of the other components in the building. So we did it in a building which was comparable to a three bedroom bungalow. But for insurance purposes at the moment, we had to do it in a commercial building when the building was empty on weekends. So we, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't just put it in someone's home. But the trial worked really well. And the, um, the boiler and the heat pump and the smart controls are still there and they're using it on a day to day basis. So as I said, when you talk about the project, this is what people see. But actually on the ground for um, looking at the project as a whole, we did many other things um, because we wanted that blueprint, the blueprint that you can pick up from Milford Haven in the local area and put it in any rural community. So this is just one of the graphics that we did mapping where the hydrogen um, would come from and where we would use it, whether it would be going to the refineries. We've got loads of refineries around our waterway uh, or whether it go to the local council to do their fleets, transport for Wales for trains. Um, and all the sort of local area there. The um, Milford Haven project has just finished in September. 
We have a virtual engagement platform where you can go on and you can see all the great work that we've done. You've got reports there from systems, architecture and trading platforms. You've got reports on um, UK and national markets. If you want to know more about the, um, you know, the big picture, then you've got a business case for having local refuelers all around in different sort of communities. Um, but there's loads of stuff on there. But if you if there's something specifically that you'd like to know, then please just get in touch with me and I can send it on to you. Um, but it is quite user friendly. You can lit it literally feels like you're walking around a room. So the other project I'm going to talk to you about is our brand new project. It's called the Hydrogen Innovation Initiative. So this is a cross catapult project. So just in case you don't know, there's nine catapults across the UK. We vary from semiconductors, manufacturing, um, gene technology, absolutely loads of them. So we've all pulled together now, well, seven of us have pulled together and a few of the different technology centers to see how we can drive the innovation for hydrogen, because we see it as such an important um, tool going forward. So this project is going to look at generation, consumption, um, and really just, it's for you, it's for you. So if you've got any questions that you feel that your business needs to be solved, then just come and speak to us. Literally, because this project's just started and every March we will rescope it for the next three years. So even if we can't do it in the next six months, we could most probably do it afterwards. So we're going to build, develop, inform and try and crowd in some private investment to be able to do this. And we're going to look at innovation and supply chain capability programs, but also looking at the knowledge, skills and facilities. One of my personal um, enthusiasms is around skills. And we all know that at the moment to be able to deliver all of that offshore wind that um, Phil's mentioned, but also the hydrogen economy going forward, there's not enough skilled people here to be able to do it. So we need to upskill our workforce. And this project is also going to help that, along with the work that we're doing through the Celtic Sea Cluster. So this is some of the work that we're doing. Um, so we're going to work with the industrial clusters all across the UK. Um, we're going to make sure they're aligned, but also that they're sharing best practice, lessons learned. Because at the moment, they're all working in quite isolation, but they're all, they've all got the same common goal. So let's work together and let's do it. Then we've got the industry demonstrator projects. So we've got a green hydrogen production. So this is where we're going to put an electrolyzer on site um, in our facility in Blyde. If you don't know about our facility, go and have a look because it's amazing. It blows me away every time I go. We've got um, a testing facility for 110 megawatt blade. Um, we've got um, the cells. It's just amazing. So there now we're going to develop that to be able to test hydrogen for local SMEs or I say local, I mean local to the UK. Then we've got clean maritime. So this is where we're looking at um, the transport that goes actually around the port. And we've got a demonstrator that's going to start in the next couple of weeks where we're converting one of those um, trucks that goes around into hydrogen. And they're going to compare it then against the other trucks there to see how that works. So we're going to do power, power and heat and then also look at the digital supply chain. The last but not least, we've got our enablers and capabilities. So this is where we're going to look at end-to-end -end roadmaps for hydrogen. We're going to look at standards, regulations, policies, all the different things that we need to have in place to be able to make hydrogen work. You know, the financial business models. But as I said, the myths. What do people come up to you and say when you, so you, when you say you're going to do something with hydrogen? We want to answer those questions. We want to put it all out there in the public domain so that people don't, they understand what's happening. Our demonstrator in Milford Haven, we you can't go there without one a member of the public asking us, what are you doing? Well, isn't hydrogen going to blow up? No, it's not going to blow up because of this, this and that. So, you know, and we've had so many community days and they've all been so well attended because people do want to learn. They see that it's coming and they really want to understand. So this is what this um, project is going to deliver. But as I said, please get in touch because we are so happy to help you. And that's what it's for. This is a community based project. So I think that's me. My contact details. <laughs>
Thank you very much. No, right, okay, okay. no, 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 it's perfect. Um, I know Michelle might. If there's any questions, briefly, just because I know. Are you planning on leaving? A we'll be, yeah, we'll be leaving about eleven. Okay, so just in case at the end you don't get to ask Michelle a question, does anyone in the audience is like, um, I do the roving mic thing. It's like being on there. Uh, you're probably here. But... Okay, Peter Crossland from the University of Exeter. When you look at the electrical system in the um, the Humber region and the South Yorkshire region, National Grid is building new transmission lines. It's planning for from the South Humber across into East Anglia. Mm -hmm. When you look at the southwest of England, there's very few transmission lines. Of course, we're strengthening near Hinkley Sea to allow that power to move across to the southeast England. How can the south, how can Cornwall be that energy centre as compared to northeast England and uh, Yorkshire and Humber, which is really where there's a lot of infrastructure being put in to enhance the energy transport capacity. Yeah. Electricity is most probably not my subject, but what I can say is, um, and not so much about Cornwall, but if you look at what they've just done with Wales, we've obviously got the same electrical problems we, in, that you have. So um, Wales and West Utilities are going to put a new hydrogen line through from Milford Haven all the way through to Swansea. And that's kind of their prototype line. And um, yesterday, Matt Hindle from Wales and West spoke. And after, if that one works, then they'll do the same in your area. So, but yeah, I'm afraid electricity is not quite my uh, subject. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks again, Michelle. All right. Thank you. I don't think anyone, no, okay. Okay, up next, we've got um, James McNaughton from the Centre for Future Clean Mobility. It's commercial manager. Um, are you sure? Go on, I love a mic. You love a, would you like a clip on mic? Come on, I'm trying to sell these things. It's all right, Joey. No, it's... They won't hear you online. Can you hear me right, okay? Yeah. All right. So, let's right. Okay, so, um, yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm the commercial manager for the Centre for Future Clean Mobility. Um, University of Exeter. Um, so I've got another colleague here, Peter from University of Exeter, who've been allowed into Plymouth today. So uh, thank you for letting us in. Um, yeah, so the presentation really is a little overview of what we're doing with uh, clean power trains and how we're utilizing hydrogen um, uh, as, a, as a research tool. So the the centre's based just outside Exeter, a bit unusual for X University. They've, they've got a campus um, in the centre of the town, but in the science park, just on the edge, um, not too far from Met Office, they've uh, put up a new building there with three research groups. So our research group, Centre for Future Clean Mobility, Peter's group, who's here today, Smart Grid, and there's a structural engineering research group there as well. The... Centre was built, um, actually the building went up about five years ago, but we've only been in the centre about two years. And um, we were lucky enough to get some funding from the local economic partnership, so Southwest LEP. Um, so we attracted a couple of million pounds from the LEP that enabled us to fit out the building. <clears throat> so that gave us a physical presence. Prior to that, we were a, kind of a virtual team, academics working across the university, but not in one centre. So it's good that we managed to move in. Um, timing wasn't perfect. So just after COVID, so some complications there, but uh, we're up and running now. So that's uh, a little snapshot of the team. Um, that's taken about six months ago. I need to update this, but there's about 10 more staff starting in January. We've just won a couple of bids. Um, so our, our, our staff numbers are gonna go up quite rapidly. So, yeah, what do we do? Um, in a nutshell, what we'll do is we'll work across any, any transport sector you like. So whether it's sea, rail, maritime, automotive, you name it, construction. Um, and we'll help companies who want to decarbonize. So they want to take the diesel or petrol out of the loop and replace it with a clean powertrain. Um, 
largely in the automotive sector, this has been done. You can go and buy a Tesla tomorrow. It's, it's a done deal. There's no research and development really there. Um, but with um, organisations that own things like cranes, HGVs, uh, ocean-going ships, fire engines, for example, there's a huge amount of R&D that still needs to go into this area to work out what is the most optimum powertrain to use. <clears throat> and more, more often than not, we're looking at hydrogen mixed with um, lithium, fuel, lithium, lithium battery. That's the mix we're looking at. Um, but the important bit about what the university is doing and, and the research and development is the modeling uh, and optimization of the, the most efficient um, uh, uh, powertrain that you need for your asset. So those are some of the companies we've worked with and are working with. Um, and we work with, obviously, the Catapults and we work with other universities. We've had projects here at Plymouth, um, but also with Strathclyde University. Um, some smaller companies there, um, like Quattro, who are a local, local company, and, and Dana in, in Devon. Uh, but some of the larger companies like Serco and Babcock are also people we've worked with because they've all got the same, same issues. So this is our strategy. Um, so close partnership working with industry. We were looking to really drive and leverage funding um, for, for innovation, essentially, from industry and government. Application into new products and services and obviously making an impact on climate change because all the products that we, we end up with um, are going to be zero emission. So it's fundamental research into zero emission powertrains, large, complex and long endurance assets, some of which you've seen a few pictures of there. And we're looking at the clean powertrain test and design. And to enable us to do that, we've got the UK's first fully um, hybrid dynamometer. So uh, I didn't know what a dynamometer was until a couple of years ago. And there are a few of them in the UK. They're essentially test bays. Um, so if you've designed a powertrain and you want to assemble a fuel cell uh, with, a, with an inverter, with a motor, with a lithium pack, this is the place to do it. And we can go up to nearly one megawatt, which is nothing when you're talking about the power output of a wind turbine. But for testing a powertrain for an ocean-going vessel or a crane or a fire engine, it's perfect. So that allows us to plug in hydrogen, electric, and any um, uh, combination that you like. So there's, there's nothing like that really in the UK. Bath University has got dynamometers, but they're purely for the internal combustion engine. And I believe Ricardo, which is an industry um, further up north, has also got some small dynamometers, but nothing on this scale. And this is what the Southwest Local Economic Partnership essentially paid for us to have in the Southwest. So we're quite lucky to have this asset. Um, yeah, so the background, I mean, you, you've, you've heard all this before. This is all the uh, legislation around going to net zero. So it's affecting everybody. Um, so whether you're a, uh, a construction company in Mid-Devon or a train company, you've got to look at alternative propulsion uh, options um, and there's no way around it. You can't get out of it. So a lot of the companies we're talking to, um, clearly they're looking at this from a, from a climate change perspective, but they're all also looking at it from, a, from a, an immediate business need. They can't continue to operate for using diesel um, some legislation in, in central London. Um, we know it's just going to hit them very badly and they won't be able to operate units there. So they need to have a, a solution. And hydrogen really, um, for the bigger assets, is the only solution. So this is all about the clean maritime plan. I won't dwell on this too much, but it's, again, it's all legislation around driving uh, and decarbonising um, the, the maritime sector. And again, all the stuff around 2020, 2050, and the targets that we're, we're trying to hit. So that's what's driving, driving businesses. So I'll sort of give you a few examples of where we've worked. Um, this is a good example, because it's uh, a project we worked with Plymouth University. Um, back in 2018, there was a small amount of money from um, Mara UK, which is government funding, uh, to help companies retrofit clean propulsion systems. So this is a small little uh, ferry, as you can see, top right corner there, carries seven passengers. A very simple project for us. It was all about taking a, a, or remodeling a clean powertrain 
um, it was using actually pure electric um, lithium on this project, but it worked perfectly well for the ferry. Um, and I believe now for, in Plymouth, there's been quite a lot of investment into electric charging for, for the maritime sector in itself. The company, um, Plymouth Ferry Boat Trips, now wants to um, go green on the bottom right-hand corner ferry, so a much larger ferry. Obviously, they couldn't do that on just electric, um, just lithium, so they're going to have to look at hydrogen uh, fuel cells for that one. So that could be a next project for us. Another example, uh, Quattro Group. So if anyone's ever been sat on a train and, and stuck somewhere by a siding and looked out the window and seen some uh, activity going on, these guys are uh, basically pulling up the tracks, um, doing a lot of the drainage, a lot of the dirty, boring work. But um, they've seen a real need to go uh, zero emission. They've got contracts in central London, working on the tubes, um, HS2, et cetera. They can't win new contracts with old diesel um, uh, assets. So effectively, that sort of a, a JCB that can go on, onto the rails. Um, we won funding from Innovate UK through the Office for Low Emission Vehicles. Interestingly, that's recently changed to Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. Um, and we've helped them design um, a fully uh, uh, integrated clean powertrain for that, that vehicle. Uh, so that helped them actually develop new contracts with Network Rail as a result of this. Um, they can scale up, build these in-house, and off they go. Uh, okay, so this is the last case study. Um, interestingly, we're doing quite a lot of maritime now. I, I think probably just because the geography of Exeter and being close to Plymouth, um, and we've, we've done a bit, quite a bit on the harbour down here, but we've attracted a lot of attention from, from companies like Serco and OS Energy. OS Energy, interestingly, do all the um, offshore wind farm uh, maintenance. Uh, so they're looking to win new contracts. And under scope three, it's very difficult to win those contracts if you've got diesel propulsion units. So they need their, their vessels to go out there um, using basically clean propulsion systems. And Serco are a, a large organization, as you probably heard of, they, they do a lot of the maintenance and, and support for, for MOD. Um, Ecomar Propulsion are a small company in Fairham, just outside Southampton, and we helped them design their first um, fully electric outboard, 250 kilowatt outboard, which is uh, purely a zero emission outboard. That's a first for the UK as well. You can buy electric outboards currently in the UK, um, but they'll be manufactured either in Germany or China. So these are actually being built in the UK. So a good, good one for UK PLC. This um, is quite an interesting slide. So what I'm trying to show you here, uh, if anyone's driven a diesel on the motorway and you know how efficient diesel cars can be on the motorway, running around 60, 70 miles an hour, and they're terrible at um, going around town, that's exactly the same for a hydrogen fuel cell. Um, hydrogen fuel cells do not like um, being asked to uh, high power, low power all the time. They don't work well at that level. So this is um, a set of uh, duty cycles for a work boat that's basically gone out, left the harbour, done some manoeuvring, done some operational maintenance, then come back. All the peak, peak, uh, peaks you can see there, we've mapped that across. So we understand where, where the typical power needs are going to be. They'll be replaced with uh, power from a lithium battery pack. Everything at the lower end, the constant end, will be a hydrogen fuel cell. So hydrogen fuel cell will be running constantly throughout the entire day. It's really, really efficient to do that. And then any peak loading will be using the lithium battery. And what we've done is the optimization and modeling of the best powertrain to go with the best, um, the best lithium fuel cell to go with the, the best hydrogen fuel cell. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, but it, it works. It works really well. Really hard for big assets to go lithium only. Um, okay. So I think in summary, hydrogen works and it works really well. Um, it's not easy, uh, good for university because lots of research and development uh, that needs to be, take place in this area. But it's certainly from our, from our understanding, working with the industry, we can provide solutions. Um, 
Last, uh, not last slide. So, yeah, a bit of good news for us. I think someone mentioned the clean maritime demonstration competition. So we recently won a couple of new projects out of that. So that's um, good news. That's um, working on 250, 325 um, HP uh, clean powertrains. Um, and we've recently submitted for clean maritime demonstration three uh, last month which we'll know about uh, in the new year. So um, there's lots of work coming to us basically from the maritime sector. I think we've taken 25% of all the funding at Clean Marit Maritime uh, last year. And yeah, that's it. Uh, there's my email, contact details. Happy to take questions now or later on. Thanks, James. I think we'll um, say that to the end, if that's all right with you. Yeah, unless anyone's got anything pressing. Thanks very much. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, really interesting to see how lithium and hydrogen have to work together, like we all have to. So, um, great. Um, up next, without further ado, uh, we have Holly Makin, who's the uh, business development executive at Element 2. Um, over to you, Holly. Would you like the mic? No one loves the mic. I love the mic. No, no. There's a clicker. You've got a laser at the top as well. And if you stand right close to that, you're okay. Cool, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. My name's Holly. I am a business development executive at Element2. Um, so I'm just here to give you a brief overview as to what we do and um, kind of our role as a business. So Element2 is, it's main, our main goal is to build the first kind of UK network of hydrogen refueling stations with the main aim of decarbonising um, British road transport. So we are mainly looking, our main sector, kind of our niche, we believe at the moment is heavy, heavy um, duty vehicles. Now this is just, as has, was previously mentioned, the batteries just don't perform well in heavy goods. So there's much more of a role for hydrogen here. And we're looking also at kind of helping convert municipal fleets, specifically kind of buses and um, lorries and things like that. So we provide we pride ourselves on turnkey solutions. So start to finish. And we aim to use green hydrogen as and when. Obviously, green hydrogen is what everyone wants. And it's what it's really what we focus on. But what we also think is really important is providing local high, local green hydrogen to the refueler. So not having to transport it across the country, because obviously that is really inefficient and just doesn't make much sense. So what we do is we integrate the two um, ends of the value chain. So the supply and the demand by because we buy the hydrogen, we, we transport it, we, in we install the re re um, refueling infrastructure and then we provide the retail point there. And as I've mentioned, so that's our main aim, really, uh, in brief, would be to provide the UK's first hydrogen refueling network. Our aim is to span the entire UK by the end of 2027. And also, one thing we take real pride in is safety. Hydrogen, as we all know, it's a fuel and it needs to be treated with respect, especially with public scepticism around it. However, when, when treated with respect, it can... It's super beneficial, works really well, um, but we really take pride in safety, safety for our employees, safety for our customers, safety for our customers, clients and such. So I'm just going to touch briefly on this, but we've um, been told by our investors that our management team is more like a FTSE 500 company than a startup because we are a startup. We're only two years old. So there's a huge uh, amount of wealth of knowledge on our management team, years um, of industry experience in science and development for big organizations. Um, so yeah, we don't need to go more in depth about that. That's just me saying that we have a, a wide range of skills and this is our advisory board. Again, big brands, lots of experience. Um, okay, so a lot of this has been mentioned already, so I won't dwell. There's a, you know, there's net zero targets. The IEA has um, published an, an energy outlook saying that the tipping point of peak oil will depend on the transport sector. So just emphasizing how important tra the transport sector is and looking at low carbon options for it. The giving a 
well, looking at a hydrogen economy, but looking at a low carbon energy economy will work perfectly with kind of an energy trilemma as such. So decarbonisation, security of supply, and obviously affordability, with security being a really big issue, as we all know, um, with everything that's happening in Russia and the Ukraine. So using green hydrogen, using UK-based offshore wind and renewable energies mean that our energy sources will be independent, which is obviously really important, especially at the moment. Hydrogen, as I've mentioned, is a great solution for heavy goods. And hydrogen fueling infrastructure we see is kind of the last remaining real barrier to decarbonisation of road transport. Um, there are hydrogen powered vehicles coming online. At the moment, there's not loads of them because they're really in demand, but there's going to be more and more coming um, out. And so we believe that the greater our network, the easier it is to, to decarbonise. So, and obviously this will give, you know, a chance to upscale and things like that. So um, hydrogen in the headlines, again, I think a lot of this won't be news, but more, um, really recently the Rolls-Royce um, jet engine has been tested. Um, so, you know, there's loads of things that are currently coming online, super relevant, really important. So our mission, as I have already mentioned, is to make diesel history, is to decarbonize um, transport sector. Um, we're looking at municipal fleets, heavy, heavy, heavy duty vehicles, and we, we take up, we take pride in that we we have lots of contacts with the vehicle manufacturers, so we really uh, are very happy to help fleets look to switch to cleaner fuels. We want to establish our network, and we want to. Our aim is to displace over half a million tons of CO two a year by twenty twenty six. So, again, this won't be news to many people. Hydrogen, most abundant element on Earth, um, and then there's a few stats. 2019, there were 30,000 tonnes of particular matter emitted by diesel trucks, lots of health costs, the, um, and hydrogen fuel cells, vehicles indirectly eliminate all other forms of air pollution, such as particulates and NOx, which in urban environments are kind of equivalent passive smoking. So really nasty stuff. So another reason why we think it's really important. Something that, so this is our current network. We, as you can see, we're currently spanning kind of North Scotland to kind of mid Midlands. Not all these sites are active. A lot of them are optioned. So, but what the, this is kind of what I've mentioned about our network that we want. There are obviously gaps and rooms for development. And that's, I mean, we're only two years old. So there's always going to be gaps. There, as has been mentioned, Scotland's, there's loads of green hydrogen coming in Scotland. It's a really good, good area to try and kind of tackle and start and do trials. So Scotland's quite um, active and then north of England as well, um, just because of the you know combination of municipal funding, green energy and such. So this is a slightly, like there are some chart um, some bits here that need to be updated. There is, there are um, a couple of refueling stations in Wales on the South Corridor that um, are in process and Southwest England, as you can see, is a bit blank, but that's my job is to try and make it, try and fill it up a bit. So sources of hydrogen. So the majority of these actually, this is a slightly out of date chart because apart from um, industrial waste, everything else is going to be pushed back a year. So obviously green hydrogen is what we want, but at, you know, to fill the gap, we have to look at it from other places and it's just, it is what it is. There's loads of green hydrogen that's going to come online in the next probably three, four years. But, you know, in order to get infrastructure going, in order to get people thinking about it, like we need to start now. And so this is um, currently kind of the sources that we can see. Again, it needs updating because there's loads of hydrogen that's coming in into the South Wales corridor specifically. Um, and there's, so I think that will be, as, as has been mentioned, that will be a really great, I think, um, micro example of kind of a hydrogen society. So element two specific role in the value chain is we provide that block in the middle. So we will buy the hydrogen, we install refueling infrastructure, we store it, and we will refuel um, any hydrogen powered vehicle. So these are our kind of solutions. So we really pride ourselves on the fact that we're, we're really flexible. We try and provide bespoke solutions to our customers when possible. We have light units and we have then on the other side a dedicated site unit which is a forecourt unit 
Um, the light units are great because they're great if you want to trial hydrogen vehicles. They um, and you don't need planning permission for them, so you can we can pick them up and move them around as and when, which um, is perfect for trials. It's also good to know if a site's not working, if people don't come, you know, if that's not where lo those people are going to stop by, we can move it. It's really no problem. Um, each different option has kind of a large capacity. So you're on 50 kilos a day to, four, to 400 and then all the way up to 3000 tons, 3000 kilos. So um, it's, we provide a real range and we really pr um, pride ourselves on that. And then just simply our model. So we always put safety first. It's really, really important. I think it's important to be super kind of visible and proactive on safety, especially with um, public reservations. We are also technologically agnostic. We don't commit ourselves to specific technologies. If there's new technologies and there's constantly new technology at the moment, we will use the best technology for the specific client at that specific time. That's also really important to us. Flexible, as I've mentioned, we um, we can, because of the, our options that we don't need planning permission, we could, in theory, put a hydrogen refueling site, mobile unit on your site tomorrow. Um, no planning permission is needed for that. The one boundary, I guess, to that would be that we do rigorous health and safety checks on sites before we put them in. So that might be a slight delay. But, but my point being is that we can do them really quickly. And as I've also mentioned, individual bespoke tailored solutions to kind of fit the need. And yeah, just to sum summarize what we do. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I've been saying all those points, but our main thing is the safe, our safety, and that we are aiming to provide a UK wide network by 2027. And yeah, we can refuel any vehicle. And, you know, we, all, we are all aware of the climate crisis. It's really important. It's at you know, it's the reason why we do what we do. And so our aim is to de decarbonize road transport and make diesel history. Brilliant, thank you, Holly, that's lovely. Thanks very much. I really like the progression of uh, energy generation, maybe like, you know, where's it gonna be used, powertrains, uh, vehicles, and then, we're trying to give a kind of a, div a diverse use of hydrogen in this event. So, um, so many of us may have thought about uh, injecting it into the gas pipeline, and our next speaker might give us a, an illumination on that particular process potentially. So, welcome Darren Stockley from Mixora Energy. He said 19 years experience in renewable energy and waste management. Is that correct, Darren? And you're still not going to bother them. <laughs> There's a clicker, okay. uh, right and left, and just. Okay, good. Thank you. Hi, uh, as has been mentioned, I'm Darren Stockley from, um, from Exora Energy. Um, and, and I'm slightly different, I think, as a speaker today, because uh, I'm not coming here telling you that I'm a hydrogen expert, and I'm coming to you sort of with a little bit of a problem that people like you, I think, will help me, help me solve over time. So what, what, what's my company? Uh, so anaerobic digestion, or AD, as everybody, everybody calls it, Currently, what we, we do is we take, um, we extract energy from animal manures, chicken litter, pig slurries, uh, cow manures, and the like. Uh, we mix it with sustainably grown crop and, uh, and food waste. But when I describe food waste, it's not the sort of stuff that you put into your bin. It's uh, leftover apples from the cider industry. It's the potatoes that Tesco throw away. It's, 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 that, it's that type of material, leftover from the milk and cheese process. And uh, we put it into a, into a big digester and, and, and extract the gas out of it to create renewable energy. Um, what makes AD different to, to wind or to, uh, to solar? First, it it, it's a renewable gas, and there's not many industries that produce a renewable gas as opposed to, as opposed to electricity. And it works 24-7, 365, const a constant dependable flow the whole, the whole time, constant flow into the, into the grid. Uh, currently, we have five plants based around the southwest. Um, we we power about get, getting on for for ten thousand homes uh, with with renewable gas, so enough to heat heat uh, and and for cooking as well, and about the same number of houses on on renewable electricity as well. So some of our sites are 
electricity sites and some of them are gas sites. So there's three gas sites where they're right next to, to the actual gas grid, and that's going to be, become more important as we as, as, as I progress. Our, our big aim is re already is to re reduce reliance on fossil fuels. And as you'll see in this presentation, I think there's some potential to, to, to work with some of you guys around hydrogen going forward. And particularly Gary will come on. We're already doing some, some work with Gary and who he'll, he'll, he'll be talking later as well. So what is our process? Our process at the moment is that uh, we take, uh, take the waste, as I mentioned, they go into an anaerobic digester, which is basically is, is a huge, great version of your stomach. Uh, the, the bacteria in the, in the digester break down, break down the, the feedstock, release the energy uh, in the form of a, dirt, a dirty biogas. We then clean that gas up and we either put it into, a, into a, an engine for renewable electricity, or we clean the gas and put that directly into a, into a grid. And as I mentioned, our three biggest sites are actually connected directly over, over the main gas grid. The one, the one in Exeter is, is, is actually directly on a massive pipeline that runs, runs directly into Exeter. And at the moment, we don't do that. Uh, well, we do this on a very small scale, but also there's electricity to power, power cars. We don't use any of our gas at the moment to power any vehicles. Complicated slide, but the basic principle is at the moment is the aim of the site is to create a circular economy for, for the sort of local agriculture and the food process. So at, at its most plain is the, the industries grow, the, grow or produce the food, the food goes to the communities, the waste from, from the food production comes into the AD, we turn that back into energy and then supply the energy back to the industry or back to, back to the homes. So th that is the circular economy we currently actually op operate to there. That, that, that's what we're actually trying to achieve. And that's one. That's what one looks like. So this is one of our. This is one of our anaerobic, anaerobic digestion systems. I'll uh, go off off mic, but basically this area here is is storing the crop feedstock. The flat this there is the digester, is the big stomach, um, which is is what's called a ring and ring digester. So the material goes in. It's 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 brought up to a temperature of about forty five degrees, and then it stays in there for about anywhere between sixty and hundred days while the while the bacteria release the energy. The gas that's created goes into the dome tank. That's a, that's a storage tank for the gas. And uh, the reason we have a storage tank is because uh, the actual energy production into the outside world, it, 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 the, the, the production is, 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 is a consistent flow, whereas the actual gas production isn't consistent. So the, so the dome acts as a, as a, as a buffer for the, between the production and the, and the export. And then this area here, these are our renewable energy engines or our gas cleanup system, and directly underneath there is the connection to the actual gas grid. The rest of it is, the rest of it is actually the farm where we get all the, all the manures from, and which we don't own the farm, we don't own any other farms. But kind of what am I here today doing in terms of a, at a hydrogen event, because I do renewable gas. Um, so I, I think, and I'm really starting to see that our, our projects are 20 years projects and they all kicked off in 2015. They're all backed by a government subsidy, the same as the wind turbines. They're all locked into a, into a government subsidy. And I think over the 20 year cycle of these projects, hydrogen and, and this sort of technology is going, to come up, is going to come up and overtake exactly what we're doing at the moment, or at least impact on exactly what we're doing. So where do I actually think it's going to, going to interact? Um, at, the, at, the moment, uh, at the moment, well, it's going to impact in three ways, I think. The uh, AD makes use of hydrogen as part of, its, as part of its process. Can the hydrogen be extracted out to, to be a more efficient gas produced and put into the network rather than actually the methane that we produce at the moment? Uh, and, and how can that actually be fed into any network or major, made most useful? So the feedstock that we actually have at the moment, and we've got some research going on at one of our sites based in Somerset at the moment, is to try and make the AD system more efficient. The anaerobic digestion system at the moment is a naturally occurring four-stage sort of bacteria breakdown of the feedstock to produce the gas. And the feeling is from some, some people doing some research on our site, we can actually get the first two stages of that 
anaerobic digestion system actually done before we actually put the feedstock into the into the actual digester itself. So we can one and one of those stages is extracting out the hydrogen. So the plan at the moment is now to is to do a trial where we can demonstrate we can extract out the hydrogen before we actually put the feedstock into the digester. But at this, mo this moment in time, all we're then going to do is re reintroduce the hydrogen into the process and, and, and make the anaerobic digestion process more efficient. But if we've extracted the hydrogen, at, uh, I think at some point in time, the, the balance will tilt as it might be, might be more useful to make use of that hydrogen rather than necessarily just putting it back into the digester. So that, so that sort of research has already sort of, sort of kicked off, but we don't, I don't have the answers yet. So you can see the formula there you, and you can see lots of H's in there um, at, at the moment with the material coming in. And currently what we're producing is we're producing a methane gas and, and, and CO2. As I say, early, early trials suggest that there is the potential to, to accelerate, the hyd accelerate the digestive process and pull out the hydrogen. And we'll have to, have to see whether over time there's better that we can be doing with the hydrogen rather than continue to create, create the methane gas. But then also the, the big opportunity I think exists that at the moment, the, the, all three of our sites are actually directly above a, a, gas, a gas grid. And we've already started having conversations with Wales and West, and, and they want us to actually under, start undertaking some trials to have a look at what we can do in terms of blending hydrogen into their networks. So at the moment, to give you, give you an idea, our Exeter-based um, site is next to a huge, gate, huge great gas grid. We have a license to put 1,500 meter cubes of gas per hour into, into that grid. And at the moment, our technology at the moment only enables us to put 700 or, or to utilize 700 meter cubes of that, of that technology. So on, on one level, we could even, you know, we can try and do clever things about separating out the hydrogen and look, see whether we can do that. But on another level, at its, at its most basic, we've got a huge bloody great connection there that we could put some electrolyzers around the site or, or, or do something along those lines just to make use of, of a connection that is already there. We're also doing, so, as, as I mentioned, Gary will come on to things that we're actually looking at on that, on that side of things. But we're also, on behalf of Wales and West, looking at something called a tea blender, which is basically going to be where we extract gas from the network. We actually blend it, the hydrogen and the gas on site to get a, to get a, a blend that they're actually comfortable with. And then there would be a sort of a gate that, and, and says, once you've got the right blend, you can actually inject it back into the, into the main gas grid as well. So, so we've actually got, got a connection. So uh, I, I, I think the message from me at the moment is, I think these AD plants will evolve over the next few years. And I think hydrogen has got a quite important part to play in it. And there you go. Brilliant. Thanks, Aaron. He's got the connection. That's what, that's what I've taken from that. <laughs> He's the connected man. Um, brilliant. That's really interesting. I think that, again, we can see how hydrogen's you know, has a has a has a wide reach here, um, and it'd be interesting to see whether places like the AD site at Exeter get utilised for injecting hydrogen straight into the gas network. We got up next. Um, I've been told if you don't talk into the mic, the people online will not hear you. <laughs> but you can stand at the lectern. So um, over to uh, Ian Kingscott. Um, and he's a group technical director for Stayback and Gasco, I yeah. do believe. Right with them being the yeah. laser pointers up there. Yeah. Yes, right. Thanks. Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Ian. I'm the um, group technical director for Stovax and Gasco. Um, we're a, a company located in Exeter. Um, Stovax is the UK's largest manufacturer of biomass burning decorative heating stoves and Gasco is the UK's largest manufacturer of gas decorative local space heaters and the second largest in electric um, decorative local space heaters. Um, and we are part of the NIBI group, um, which is a Swedish um, owned group. Um, and the vast majority of the group um, is um, involved in the manufacture of um, renewables. Um, so 
the biggest part of the group by far is um, the heat pump industry, uh, which Neve is one of the largest companies in the world. Um, so the whole philosophy of the group really is on trying to move forward with uh, renewable energy in the future. Um, so um, why hydrogen? Um, all, the, all the presentations this morning so far, all the great presentations have touched on the uh, manufacture of hydrogen and how it can be used in industry, how it can be used in transport. Um, but my focus is obviously on the domestic um, heating industry um, and uh, an issues there, how can it be used in people's homes? If it were to be supplied domestically, um, what, it, what could we actually possibly do with it? Um, and at the moment, domestic use still accounts for 16% of all greenhouse gas emissions uh, from homes. Uh, and the main driver for that is the combustion of fossil gas for heating and cooking. Um, full electrification would require significant improvement to the electric distribution network to meet the power requirements. I think that's well researched. Um, the gas distribution network is already capable of supplying a methane hydrogen blend. Uh, that's been proven. A lot of work's been done on the use of 100% um, hydrogen within that blend. The UK pretty much leads the world in being able to use hydrogen at the moment because a lot of the supply network, the piping network has been replaced with plastic piping and uh, plastic connections, um, which are all capable of supplying um, the transport of hydrogen. And the costs of full electrification, um, especially if people were going down the heat pump route, would be cost preventative to an awful lot of households. Um, there is a huge difference, differential between installing a heat pump, installing a, um, a domestic boiler. Uh, and therefore, obviously, it would require large subsidies to kick this off from the government. Um, so whilst reductions have taken uh, place in total CO2 emissions, uh, you can still see from that um, at the bottom of there at the moment, CO2 generated directly by UK households is pretty much on an even kill. There's been very little reduction over the years where there's already reduction in the other, in the other sectors. Um, so um, the, the main thing um, that I'm talking about this morning is, um, is our participation in the High for Heat um, programme. The High for Heat programme was initiated by um, uh, the um, Department for Business uh, and Energy um, and uh, was set up basically to see if it was technically possible, safe and convenient to replace gas um, with 100% hydrogen in residential, commercial and uh, buildings and gas appliances uh, to enable the government to obviously start making decisions on uh, the future of hydrogen. Um, so the high for heat program was um, built up of several lots uh, and lot four was basically um, a to to actually look at um, the matter the, the design and development of products um, in the domestic sector um, where uh, methane could be replaced by hydrogen so cooking domestic boilers and local space eaters um, which is the area that um, we're involved in so Gasco as part of this um, joined the consortium. Um, we realized that at the very early stages, it's very difficult to do this on our own. Uh, we needed um, business partners to be able to bid for these um, parts of the, um, uh, of the, the, the government's um, set um, that they put out for tender. Um, and so um, there's a couple of other manufacturers in the UK that we joined up with, um, Charlton and Jenrick and Valor. Um, uh, and also um, two suppliers, Beckett Thermal Solutions, which is a burner manufacturer, and Teddington Controls based down in St. Austell, um, which is a, um, a control valve manufacturer. Uh, we work together under the name of High Fires. Um, and basically, uh, the, the program that we um, that was put forward, phase one was basically to come up with a plan um, to effectively achieve a working prototype of an existing gas fire, um, then to produce um, uh, demonstration prototypes to develop that uh, into a prototype um, which had provisional certification, uh, and then basically to redevelop it after that to actually gain full certification on it um, in order to be able to use these in um, unoccupied and then occupied field trials. 
Uh, and then the final part of the plan was to deliver a final sample for demonstration at COP26 uh, and formulate the next steps. This program started over four years ago. Unfortunately, it was obviously very, very impacted by COVID and uh, a vast majority of the development took place remotely. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the, the, the part of the testing that um, we're obviously going to have our own development facilities, we're putting in a hydrogen testing facility at the very early parts of this um, program would have been obviously uneconomical um, to the manufacturers involved. So we worked with a, um, a, a consultancy based in Hull, uh, Enatech International, who built a, um, a hydrogen um, test development facility there. So whilst we did all the development, all the prototypes, uh, all the redevelopment, the actual physical test work took place in Hull. The vast majority of, them was, of that was done by teams because obviously um, we were in the midst of COVID at the time. So what did we actually do? So um, phase one, um, we actually, um, accept, we, we had three bids accepted, um, open fronted appliance. So a very typical um, gas fire, open fronted gas fire. Um, these are all based on the most commonly um, installed products in the UK from a local space heating point of view. So we chose three products that were representative of a, of a large market segment. Uh, glass fronted fire, uh, those two previous products were done by the other two consortium manufacturers. Gasco is, um, is, is quite renowned for balanced flue product development, so completely sealed to the room in which it's in, takes its air for combustion from outside the property and then delivers the combustion products to outside the property through a concentric flue system. And that's where our speciality um, is because we are strongly involved in uh, European supply as well, where balanced flu is the is the predominant um, um, designer product. Uh, so we mapped out the project. Um, phase two, um, A, um, we got to the point where we produced five samples of each um, appliance, uh, designed, developed and tested. Um, we gained initial CE um, and gas appliance regulation evaluation, which was carried out by BSI. Um, and then basically two of our appliances, two of the Gasco appliances are installed at lower form the hydrogen demonstration site in Gateshead. So those two homes, the, uh, the high homes um, in Highgrove, um, were built specifically um, for um, demonstration of 100% hydrogen appliances. So in each of those properties, there's a, there's a um, domestic boiler, there's a Worcester Bosch boiler in one, there's a Baxi boiler in the other one. Um, and uh, in both properties, there's a cooking appliance um, operating on hydrogen. And then in both of those properties, there's a domestic um, gas fire, balanced flue gas fire uh, provided by ourselves. Um, and those have now been installed for over a year. They're open to, they were open to business, to council, to, to government, to um, council leaders, uh, and then to the general public and industry. Um, and I've been for the last year and hundreds of people have passed through those homes over that time um, looking at these. Um, the, um, the, the running alongside the program that we've done is obviously all the other parts of the, uh, the lots that, Bay, that Bayes have put out. Um, and one of those is obviously the development of the standards in order to be able to test these products as well, as no test standard actually um, exists. So um, a member of my team has been heavily involved with the BSI committee on developing the standards as well. And we've learned going along there what requirements for those standards should be. So we've moved now to the, um, to the final phase, which has now been completed. We've gained full CE UKCA certification on the products. Uh, and the final box uh, samples are still with the management team. Uh, a, a lot of the a lot of the, the work um, has stalled a little bit um, over the last year, um, but the um, the we're now waiting for the next stages. Obviously, during the development process for us, there were there was a huge learning curve. Um, having done it, obviously knowing what we know now, we would do things very differently. Um, but we've got to where we have today with products that are safe. Um, work on 100% hydrogen. The next stage is to look at the long-term reliability and durability of those products. There were several things promised at the beginning of this um, program. 
one of those was unoccupied field trials. That never actually got done. They jumped straight to occupied field trials. Um, so the longevity testing is still to be done. Um, and this is where we're looking for the future. Um, major issues to have to be overcome is obviously the ignition of hydrogen needs to be absolutely instantaneous. Any delay, um, obviously, not only will cause mini explosion, but also the sound um, can actually harm um, hearing. Um, and, um, and so we work with Teddington Controls uh, to develop a, um, a fully electronic control system um, with sensors to ensure that if the burner didn't see a flame in a certain amount of time, um, which was about 1.6 seconds, then obviously to cut off the gas supply to the product. Um, we need to ensure there's no buildup of unburnt gas in the appliance. Um, hydrogen, obviously, um, being lighter than air, uh, tends to fill the crevices at the top of the appliance if it's not evacuated immediately. So prior to any ignition, uh, a fan system uh, was developed in the uh, in the external um, flue system to actually pump air through the product um, prior to ignition, uh, with um, ignition then taking place after um, 10 seconds uh, and a pre-purge cycle being implemented in there. Things that have been done in the boiler industry for many years, um, but obviously are new to the local space industry, uh, heater industry. Uh, NOx levels on these products are much higher than when burning uh, normal methane um, due to the uh, temperature of the gas and its flame uh, characteristics when it comes out of the ports. So a lot of work was done to actually um, find a way of reducing the NOx. Uh, and we have a patent pending at the moment on a, on a ceramic material, hard ceramic material located above the burner, which basically breaks up the flame contour as soon as it leaves the burner ports. Uh, disturbing it and therefore cooling the flames, quenching them and uh, reducing the amount of NOx produced by these products. Something that we're working on even more now because we think that we can develop to a point where we can truly get these products to be ultra low emission products in all, in all, in all aspects. Uh, and the materials used, obviously hydrogen, the, um, the, um, the flame temperature of hydrogen, its base is a lot hotter. The methane, so the materials, we had to do an awful lot of work to actually uh, make sure that we've got the materials um, correct in what we're doing. As I say, um, the unoccupied field trials um, never took place. Um, we were a little bit dubious about them going straight into demonstration trials. Um, there hasn't been any problems. Um, everything's working well, but they're only on for half an hour periods. So we want to actually see, we, we normally would test what these products on methane, a new product will be tested for 10,000 hours on cycles of 10 hours on, two hours off to ensure the expansion and contraction, the heating uh, and uh, no degradation to any of the materials or the, or the methods of, um, of manufacture uh, and fastening on these products. We also want to prove the concept on alternative fuel effects. So, all the products that we've done at the moment are with an imitation coal effect, um, which is a very, very old style of product in the UK. Still, the majority of products in the UK are that. But over the last 15 years, the products have moved more to log effect fires. Uh, and that will flag up a lot more difficulties. We know um, we've, we've had to work on coloration of the flames. Obviously, hydrogen with a very translucent flame. Um, we had to play it against various surfaces in order to be able to get the um, the uh, the degree of yellow that we've got. We need to we need to further enhance that to make sure that it's fully accepted by the general public as a replacement to methane. Uh, and there's coated materials, coated metals that we're working with and playing with at the moment in order to try and do this uh, in the long term. Uh, and uh, and just basically coming up with a hydrogen ready concept. So. The, 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 true, um, the, the, the true future in this type of product, if it were to go ahead, is what the boiler industry have already labelled on, because the boiler industry have been developing these products for many, many years before these trials. Um, and, uh, and they are now at the point where they, they have products that are hydrogen ready. So they have now back flushed those products to methane, so that products could be installed as a hydrogen ready concept. So as soon as the product's installed and working on methane, uh, with very few changes to the product, it could be converted to hydrogen. Whereas at the moment, all of the gas fires that are out there 
would require either replacement or a hefty investment in replacement of the components within there. Uh, assuming the materials that the fireboxes and the outer the outer casings would withstand the temperatures uh, and the uh, of uh, and the burning of um, hydrogen, so that's really the next phase is to actually develop those products to be hydrogen ready. So um, obviously we've been working with this consortium. Um, uh, we are still working with them, and we're very involved now in various village trials and uh, and. Um, and um, town trials which are taking place. Um, the, the, the most advanced at the moment is one in Levermouth in Scotland, where they're looking at um, converting 300 homes to hydrogen. Uh, and there's village trials um, in discussion at the moment. And in fact, they're, they're advancing a lot faster than the, than the government is actually supporting at the moment. Um, so we're obviously very involved in those. Um, uh, obviously, we need to be able to provide um, uh, training for engineers to carry out the installation of hydrogen products uh, for these trials. Uh, and we need to continue to work with these consortium partners because we have learned a lot together. We've developed a lot together. And uh, I think without those partners, it would have been a very difficult thing in its infancy. Um, we work well together with this, but obviously we want to be in control of our own future and we want to bring the development of hydrogen local space heaters to the southwest. Um, we're based in Exeter. We basically want to um, bring that down here. So uh, at the moment, we're in talks with various uh, members of local government um, and looking at various issues with funding um, in order to be able to support our own facilities in order to be able to do this. Um, we are basically um, just about, well, we're going to move early next year to a purpose-built uh, building on Sky Park, um, which is next to the um, to the, um, the Exeter Science Park. Um, there's a, we've, um, we've got a building going up there at the moment, a purpose-built building. There's three laboratories going in there at the moment, which is the biomass, the, the gas, and the uh, electric um, development. Uh, and we basically want to build a hydrogen um, test facility in there and development facility in there. Um, we basically want to do something that we can bring that development to the southwest and and open it up to the southwest as well, not treat it as a, as as a development for the business. Obviously, one day when this becomes more mainstream, if it does become more mainstream, then we want to be ready to move into that part of the market as the leading manufacturer at the moment. We should be ahead of the curve. Um, but we during the during that build up to that, we want to use it to be able to basically develop these types of appliances, uh, researching suitable materials, um, developing methods of achieving the flames, uh, develop methods of uh, reducing NOx. We want it to be a resource from which the government and any industry interested industry partners can gain feedback from. It will be an open laboratory. Um, it won't be something that will be specific to us assuming that we can get the funding to do this uh, we want it to be a learning center you know we're not pioneers in hydrogen but we are well advanced in the development of home heating decorative appliances using hydrogen um, we want to be able to um, to be able to provide training uh, not only to the engineers employed uh, but also bring in new engineers as through we're looking at the moment that if this goes ahead of obviously um enhancing our apprenticeship schemes and bringing people through on the development uh, and knowledge of hydrogen development um, as well uh, and also to provide training for installers and service engineers to to become hopefully a center of excellence in hydrogen when used for domestic heating um, in the southwest um, and that really just is this one here is um is the uh is the level mouth site um uh i'm sure most people know about that at the moment um and obviously the products and the high for homes products um and uh, and yes so uh our next stages really are to when we move into that building is to as quickly as possible try to secure the funding to be able to further develop these products you know it's the government's dragged its feet a little bit since this program uh, and has kicked the can down the road a little bit for the um, for the decisions on hydrogen. 
Um, but there's more and more pace with hydrogen development, with hydrogen manufacture going on. That I'm sure that during the next few years, the the, the government uh, uh, will catch up with it. Um, I'm also on um, a board of a a, um, a, um, cons a, a board of a um, representation and lobbying group in Europe. Um, I I represent NIBI on there. And we're in constant communication and talks with the European Commission. Uh, and one of the big things that we're discussing is the future of hydrogen at the moment. Europeans are a long way behind the UK um, on the on looking into hydrogen. Probably the only country that's anywhere near as advanced as Germany, as you would expect. Um, but a lot of those, uh, a lot of that is being kicked down the road a little bit at the moment due to the energy crisis. You would have thought that more people would actually be relying on looking at these things during this. Um, but it's well recognised in Europe that full electrification is not an ideal situation because of the costs. And of, uh, if, if we think our network and our distribution is aged when it comes to um, electric supply, the ones in Europe are an awful lot worse. Um, so um, there's an awful lot of work for them to do for electrification, plus obviously the, the work that they would have to do is to subsidise the supply of heating products for full electrification. So they do recognise that um, hydrogen is a part of the future and we're constantly pushing at the Commission to try and push that forward. Thank you, everybody. Super. Thanks, Ian. It's great. Thanks very much. But, um... Someone's looking after our wood burners as we speak. Um, and good to hear about your new facility, uh, the Science Park or the Sky, Sky Park. Sure. Well, it'd be good for um, training, I think. It sounds like a really good thing. So last but not least, sometimes called the graveyard shift, or even Gary called it that himself this morning. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny, for putting me on. <laughs> um, Gary Nicholson from Hydrostar, um, who make electrolyzers. So over to you, Gary. Um, would you like a mic, Gary? Would you like a clip yeah, on mic? Oh, look at this. No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Gary Nicholson. Yes, I'm on the graveyard shift. Um, hopefully I can wake everybody up a little bit. Um, starts to get a bit boring as time goes along. Uh, not for me in uh, particular, but um, I think that... Um, Hopefully, we'll wake you up a little bit. So who am I? Why am I talking to anybody uh, in this room? Why do I feel that I should be capable of talking to anybody in this room? Um, so here's a little bit about my background. 11 years with British Coal, uh, 15 years with Rolls-Royce. Um, I was director of Rolls-Royce Advanced Controls. I was headhunted and moved to America in about year 2000. I made my money as an AI uh, CEO. Um, past that point, I've not needed to work for anybody else ever again, and I've devoted all of my career to green, uh, green technologies. Um, we have, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about the three main businesses that we have at the moment that which, um, uh, I, I'm here to represent. I'm going to talk about Hydrostar because it's green hydrogen. So um, Hydrostar is green hydrogen electrolyzer products. Our focus is on hydrogen production and hydrogen storage. Um, I don't think I've heard anybody talking too much about hydrogen storage. Um, I know James brought it up a little bit. But one of the big things that people talk about is, is this not explosive? Is it going to blow up? Are we going to create uh, more problems than we have with methane-based heating systems? Um, metal hydride storage will probably be the next big thing that you'll hear about. There are metals that will store hydrogen. And basically, it just stores it in metal. And if you can do that and then release the hydrogen later, um, it's totally safe. So we're working with James at the Center for Future Clean Mobility on sort of next generation hydrogen storage, hydrogen development. Um, we're working on big plans for big development. Um, our uh, company's focus is on developing uh, 100 megawatt blocks of power or blocks of hydrogen. Um, so we've had, I'll go on to the next slide and talk about some of that. So emerald green power and emerald green hydrogen, we're not just a hydrogen company. And um, what we've got is 
So these things are called microgrids, and that could be anything from a large solar facility to something like um, uh, uh, sort of an anaerobic digester plant. It could be anything, but the economics of a plant, whether you're making electricity, whether you're making hydrogen, what are you selling the hydrogen for, all play different uh, scopes as to how much money you're gonna make. And at the end of the day, we're trying to take fossil fuel and move to new green fuels. And it's a massive undertaking. There's so many different technologies out there. There's so many different aspects of this process uh, that it's incredible. Talking about local government, for example, I forgot, uh, Ian brought it up about local government. Exeter's saying that in the next seven years, you're going to get, they're going to get to net zero. And I, I talk to their CEO, the CEO of the council all the time. It's nearly impossible for them to do it because the, the, the hydrogen infrastructure that they're going to need is about a gigawatt just, just for Exeter. Plymouth would be near about two gigawatts. So somebody was um, talking about um, uh, wind farms, this vast amount of power that's going to come into the UK, if the grid could manage it, it would take all of that power to take the southwest of England and make it green. And then finally, I own another, or we own another business called Smart H. Um, what we're looking at there is we've, we've sort of delved, we've, we've gone down a route as a country of saying we need to replace diesel engines um, and get them all to net zero as fast as possible. And so James's group is working in the Center for Future Clean Mobility, basically trying to get rid of diesel and petrol and move to a next generation of technology. But that new techno that is new technology. So for instance, a hydrogen fuel cell is literally um, like 1% of the time that we've had developing diesels is what's currently been spent. And we don't understand the hydrogen fuel cells well enough yet to be able to build reliable vehicles. And same with the batteries. We're making battery-driven trucks. I can't see any sense in building an eight-ton truck where I need four tons of batteries. It doesn't make sense to me. But it's new technology and we're moving forward. But another element would be, why don't we just reduce the emissions to zero? Because all we've all about is the emissions side, then there could be other technologies to reduce emissions. And so Smart H is working on injecting small amounts of hydrogen into engines to reduce emissions. And it's, a, it's not a new technology, it's a, it's a very old technology. NASA have been working on this for close on 50 years. And so um, it's Smart H. So um, what are we doing from an R&D viewpoint? We're an R&D company. I've done lots of jobs in my life. I don't want to be the CEO of a big company anymore. I've been, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. What I enjoy doing is research and development. I'm also um, what's called an um, uh, angel investor. I'm continuously looking at new technologies and, de and deciding whether that technology is worth looking at and worth investing in. A lot of companies build things not realizing they have to, they're going to have to scale things up. And um, so I look at different technologies, or we look at different technologies to see whether there's some viability there. So Hydrostar, um, this last year, we've won a million pounds in R&D from what's called a smart grant. Anybody who knows what a smart grant is, they're quite difficult to get. And that's about two things. It's about hydrogen production, green hydrogen production, and then hydrogen storage using metal hydride. And we're working with London South Bank University. Uh, they've got a renowned professor there who is a, uh, a hydride, metal hydride expert. Uh, Emerald Green Power, we've just um, uh, done phase one of a base project. That base project was to develop a 100 megawatt site, theoretically, and model that site, how much hydrogen is needed. Uh, you're modeling. Um, in our case, it was the Marsh Barn Industrial Estate in Exeter. How much green hydrogen does that site need? How much would we get that site to net zero by replacing the, um, the natural gas and then modeling the production up to 100 megawatts at that site? Um, smart, so we got uh, 270K for that phase one. We're looking at phase two. That's with, um, uh, again, with um, Exeter University. Again, somebody else in James's group is helping us on some of the artificial intelligence on that. And uh, finally, Smart H. Um, so the phase two of that is 5.5 million, roughly. 
And Smart H, uh, we had an Innovate UK award of half a million this year. That's looking at using artificial intelligence to reduce emissions from diesel engines. Coming back to diesel engines, why would we play around? Diesel's a fossil fuel, isn't it? Of course it is. But if you can reduce the emissions, then you're stopping net, you're getting yourself to net zero. What we're getting muddled up sometimes is getting rid of fossil fuels and replacing them with non-fossil fuels. And there are other ways that you can skin the cat. The problem is we've got many applications where actually diesel engines are unsurmountable. They, they, they are the premium product. They've had 100 years of development, uh, originally uh, German technology, um, but we've been using diesel, diesel energy, uh, sorry, diesel engines for, for forever. And we are not going to be able to get rid of diesel engines anytime soon. If you've got big power requirements at this moment in time, Plymouth and Exeter are quite similar. There's a 50 megawatt gas turbine in the middle of Exeter on the Marsh Barton Industrial Estate. Without that gas turbine, the city does not have power. There's times of the day where that gas turbine turns on, used to, uses a vast amount of natural gas. And without that, then the city would not be able to function at certain times of the day. Other places, diesel engines do the same sort of thing. Two megawatt diesel engines are fairly common. The internet is totally um, buoyed by uh, standby uh, diesel generators. Every data center in this country, bar none, has a diesel, a large diesel generator um, sitting at the back, uh, waiting as um, a backup generator. How are we going to replace all of that? It's not as simple as, as people seem to think it is. There are solutions, but it's going to take a long time. The national grid has huge amounts of diesel generators. If a power plant goes down, it's really hard to get it back up again. Up again. So any, any power source generally relies on diesel generators to get them back up. So anyway, um, uh, so various awards that we've got. Um, Technology-wise, here's a rough. Um, this is emerald green hydrogen. So we formed a hydrogen group. We, we, cut, we started off trying to sell hydrogen, find a buyer for it, and we couldn't find one. Actually, now people like Element Two will buy hydrogen. But when we when we first started, um, you know, I, I came to the city of Exeter three years ago. I asked the CEO how much green hydrogen he needed for his city. He didn't even know what green hydrogen was. So if Karim Hassan was here, he would, he would repeat that. But the reality is now, three years later, everybody knows about green hydrogen. They don't really understand what green hydrogen is because there's, there's at least two types of green hydrogen alone. There's stuff that's from renewable substances, which isn't from fossil fuel at all. And then there's uh, electrolysis. As long as you're using renewable energy sources, then that's green hydrogen. So there's many different uh, gaps between. I've got a, we've got a full team of people now um, through mostly through Bayes and Innovate UK funding. So we're starting to put the right people together. We've got Richard Dormer at the back there, who is uh, the CEO. If anybody can turn, sorry, for everybody turning around. So Richard Dormer there is the CEO of Emerald Green Hydrogen, and sitting next to him is Ian Gordon. Ian Gordon is the CEO of Hydrostar Europe. So we started to pull senior management team together. And uh, so what does an electrolyzer look like? Um, over this side is what people generally see electrolyzers looking like. So the one that's up there is an ITM uh, electrolyzer, one megawatt in size. The stack weighs about half a ton. It's made of titanium. It's platinum tated. Platinum plated sintered titanium stack. Um, the bottom one there, or the middle middle stage, is a steam mean steam reforming plant uh, that makes hydrogen by taking natural gas, putting it through a steam process, and strip out the hydrogen. The problem with that, which is called blue hydrogen, is we haven't invented a technology to actually store that carbon away. So when we talk about blue hydrogen, it's actually gray hydrogen because they're doing nothing with the carbon component. It escapes to the air at the moment. So when you see a hydrogen bus and they say, oh, we're, we're, we're burning hydrogen, it gives off zero emissions. But unfortunately, the emissions have moved. 
they moved to where the blue hydrogen was being created. Um, I'm not going to do, do too much about the fossil fuel companies and things, but we are being greenwashed all the time. The big blue hydrogen guys, I can't fight against the shells and the BPs and all of those guys, but where's the carbon going? What are you using for this carbon capture? So it frightens the living daylights out of me. We have a huge plan to get the country to net zero. And uh, the reality is the carbon has to go somewhere. We don't drink enough Coca-Cola and other, other uh, drinks that we could have with carbonated fuel. Um, what do our technologies look like? So there's two 40 kilowatt units on the left there and two uh, 50 kilowatt units on the right. Safety, number one, this is outside stuff. I don't want stuff inside buildings. Why would I put stuff inside a building where the hydrogen can build up and blow up? So safety, safety, safety. From my point of view, I grew up working down the coal mines and we dealt with methane, which is lighter than air and floats and, and goes into all of the highest components of, of the roof. Hydrogen will go straight up. Absolutely, it's the, sm the smallest molecule in existence. So as long as you don't put something above it, it will just go straight up into the sky and very, very quickly disseminate into the atmosphere. So we're building everything to go outside. What, uh, what my love is, is the southwest of England. I live in Exeter. Um, I'm actually a Yorkshireman. You can probably tell by a slight accent still there. But unfortunately, Yorkshire is normally gray and grim. Whereas the southwest of England, we've got sun and solar farms work here. They do not work the further north in this country that you get. But what we want our hydrogen companies to look like then are these are 10 megawatt blocks. So what we would look like is a normal, a normal agricultural building. If that's 50 kilowatts, those, those red units, I need 20 of those per megawatt. And that's all I need. So the size of the units is very simple, very straightforward. What Johnny Bloor has been helping us with is sort of the artificial intelligence components of how we can make the, uh, the systems robust, resilient, and um, all the other things that we're looking for dynamic. So as the demand um, of the, ele the electrolyzer demand stays the same, the solar goes up and down or the wind goes up and down, um, wouldn't go up and down with uh, Darren Stockley's product that we're talking to Darren, uh, Darren as well. But the unit can take a lot of fluctuation in power supply. Our problem is not a problem really. Our problem is because we're going for a low cost electrolyzer. It's not 100% hydrogen. It's actually about 98% pure, which means the other 2% is oxygen. So we're working with Wales and West to inject less, um, less pure uh, product into the, into the uh, natural gas grid. Um, I've got a slightly different view uh, of, of my world. So, uh, I've got the pointer. It's on the lake, it's on the top. Is it the top one? Top. Oh, yeah, there you go. So, our focus is here. This is the M5 corridor. Our plan is to build 10 100 megawatt green hydrogen facilities down the M5. Um, we're actually starting there, potentially the bottom end of Wales. And so um, our view is that because of this uh, beautiful southwest that, that uh, we, we live in, um, we have the capability to take it as green as possible. With all of this extra power coming from overseas, whether that's nuclear from France, whether that's Moroccan solar, um, I don't care as long as it's carbon neutral, carbon free. Um, but we do have the, all of the wind, wind generation would be here. Believe me, whatever that number is that somebody puts on the board, that's how much power the Southwest needs. Somebody tells me they're building 30 gigawatts of power, that's how much power we need. What we've got at the moment is, is an electrical grid for lights and everything runs on electric. We're totally replacing that grid with a new one, which has to include gas and electric in the same grid. Um, Peter, how much is the, how much, uh, what's the, uh, the gigawatts of the country at the moment for electricity? Okay, we, we peak at about 52 gigawatts of electricity, but the problem is heat and yeah. transport. Yeah. 
of the electrical power. You look at your energy bills, there's not electric steam in there, but assuming you have a single home, there's gas for heating. Yeah, so if it's 50 gigawatts, at least another 50, so it's a third, a third, a third, a third, you're going to need at least 50 gigawatts. Just thank you. Thank you for looking after me, Johnny. Okay, so um, we're looking at industrial estates. Uh, our view is, is that there's urban energy to be created. Um, the Marsh Barn industrial estates got about 30 megawatts of capability. I can nearly offset the gas turbine, nearly, not quite yet. But that would need uh, major changes in the owners of those buildings to go and put solar on all of the roofs. And if we do that, then we've got some capability to, uh, to change things. Um, hydrogen is a crop. Electrolyzer runs on DC. It's a big difference. We don't need to turn it to AC. So what you can do is have solar or, or, or wind, which both create DC, and put them straight onto electrolyzers. The current network that we have is all set up for AC, and yet we actually can use DC for most things. So actually you might see eventually a, a change from the grids to DC rather than being AC. And if you go off grid, there's no reason at all to be on AC. Johnny, how long do we have? Um, getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> so, so we are working with um, farms as an energy vector. There are a lot of farms in the UK, certainly in the Southwest, that have applied for planning permission to build solar. And then the grid tells them they don't need it. I'm sorry, we're going to curtail you. So you spend a million pounds to connect to the grid only to be told 70% of the time, sorry, Gary, we don't need your power today. And they can just turn you on and off at will. Anybody who's got an electric vehicle probably won't, won't even realize this, but the new laws will tell them that they can't necessarily have the power all the time. You might have an electric vehicle charging up in your garage and Wales and West or whoever, it, not Wales and West, it would be National Grid in this case, because it's now... Western distribution have been bought by National Grid, they can turn the power off. So you wake up next morning and your power to the battery has not charged, the, charged at all. They're changing things in a different dimension. So if we can take have farms um, making solar, we don't need it to be AC, it can stay DC, we can take farms off grid. We're talking to Wales and West and National Grid about it, they're happy. Because if we can take them off in two megawatt chunks, each farm being two megawatts, take them off, that means there's more power on the current distribution network for chargers to charge. The whole reason behind them being able to control your charging is because they can't take, if everybody in this room had an electric vehicle and it was in credit and let's say, uh, uh, mid-Devon, you can't do it. The grid cannot cope with it. Your homes can't cope with it. So we've got a lot of things to change, a lot of things to look at. Um, so we're looking at farms as an energy vector. We've just bid a proposal with Exeter University, uh, with um, uh, the Smart Grid Group. Um, we are working direct. So here's, here's an, another different view of life. Most people today have been talking about top-down strategies. We're working on a bottom-up strategy. So what we've got, uh, and again, working with uh, Richard Dormer at the back there, we have people like uh, Ixora Energy, who want as much hydrogen as we could give them, either for their process or the fact we could inject it into the grid. Moola, Yo Valley, uh, they're both um, farm gate businesses. Um, they want to go green. How do they go green? We're, we're advising them on how to get to net zero. How much green hydrogen do you need? We have people that will help them with the microgrids and working out how much hydrogen we can produce. Uh, extra airport, somebody mentioned Rolls-Royce, um, my old company, having just announced that they've got an aircraft engine that they tested this week. Um, anybody who knows a little bit about airplanes, 
It's not the engine that's going to be the problem. It's going to be the supply chain to give them enough hydrogen to actually run the planes. On a large plane, there's two 50 megawatt gas turbines, one on each wing, the Trent engine. Can you imagine the fact that that then flies with 400 people from one side of the planet to the other? How much green hydrogen are they going to need for that aeroplane? It's a vast amount. Go back to this gigawatt of power supply. The airport alone will probably need at least one and a half gigawatts just for something like five planes a day. If you get to Heathrow size and Gatwick size, then those long haul flights are going to disappear. Long haul flights at the moment, it's are impossible to do with hydrogen, even if it's liquefied hydrogen. You can get from the UK to the east coast of the US, and that's about as far as you can get. So even with the best designs in the world, they cannot store enough hydrogen to get us uh, to the, the routes we're normally taking. <laughs> What's that one? That's my one. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I knew you were going to mention it. <laughs> you want me to do anyway, it? Anyway, thanks, Gary. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks very much, Tim. Sorry. Yeah, I thought I'd end on this slide uh, as it was a local, uh, well, a national um, headline. Um, yeah, so they got it to run on pure hydrogen. It's quite interesting. It's the old Trent engine on the left there. Um, we have not a lot of time there's a couple of questions online there's about 40 people watching um i'll go with one of those quickly for james and it says how long do you think it will be before hydrogen waste collection vehicles will be available on the market how long james how long what do you reckon so hydrogen waste materials the hydrogen bin lorry. okay all right um it, it could be tomorrow. The technology exists then. Uh, I believe Exeter City Council has now four full electric uh, waste uh, refuse vehicles, which work very well. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't go for a, a hybrid fuel cell uh, full uh, lithium back pack, uh, battery op op uh, option for a, for a vehicle. Okay, super. So that sounds like immediately. Um, a question for Holly. Uh, what was the question for Holly? It's somewhere here. Oh, you already moved it down. Thank you. Uh, expected lifespan of the refueling sites. Is that a bad question? Would you like me to move on? So, in because well, the sites are so new at the moment, because we're only two years old, we, I mean, currently they're doing great. But uh, the lifespan, I guess we don't know yet because they haven't come to end of life. Okay, so send so you slightly unknown. Anyone in the room? For, uh, oh, someone at the back. Oh my goodness. Good job I go to the gym, isn't it? All right, okay. Uh, first one to Holly. Um, I looked at that map and you've got all of those stations on there. Just to clarify, they are they're, they're for their own use. Are they sort of for local businesses or companies that are using it for their own use? Not for if there were uh, a number of uh, you know, users like ourselves with vehicles, not for them to pull in like a Sainsbury station, is it? Interesting. So are they as an interpreter? <laughs> <laughs> are they public there we go super um so we have agreements with some like councils and things yeah. so but depending on the site um they there is public access there are kind of individual you know for example in aberdeen we there are a couple of hydrogen um, cars and their public access. So it depends where you are. Yeah, that's great. I just wondered what in the future, what's your view? I mean, how are you going to expand? Are you going into the sort of, you know, refueling stations uh, across the country? Is that your next step? Yeah, so that's pretty much exactly it. So we're looking to 
work closely with um, companies, councils who are looking to trial. And then we're looking to scale up. So for, for network coverage, we'll be looking for like service stations, commercial sites um, where you would be able to pull up your car and refuel. So yeah, that's the plan. Your, your refueling, uh, your hydrogen is coming from where at the moment? And where do you envisage it coming from in the future? So there's lots of, oh, I just had myself. <laughs> uh, well, we're always looking to buy hydrogen and we'll take it tomorrow. Um, currently there's a, there's a sites of Aberdeen and there's a couple in like North of England, but as kind of, I should, kind of displayed on the map there's loads of it's obviously mainly coastal areas and there's loads of sites that are hopefully going to come online in the next kind of uh, three four years but currently we can't get enough hydrogen so we will buy it um tomorrow you know we'll buy it now anyway, yeah. i think um because you guys can have lunch together in a minute you can talk about it <laughs> you can no 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 just in case just in case anyone else has another question because time is a flying arrow uh, we live in a time after time, a time before time. Uh, my old storytelling lines coming out. Oh, excuse me. Good morning. Hi, I'm Anna Paulia from Studio Skane, on the Local Cover Devon Internship. Um, I just want to ask a very general question. The UK as a leading green hydrogen country with these new technologies, are there any like efforts to share this with other countries that might be keen on implementing this technologies? I think that's just an open question with uh, anyone in the room that's planning on going Europe. Got a few words to add. We've um, just completed a, a project with um, Singapore. Uh, so Singapore, I've got a version of Innovate UK Innovate UK is the R&D funding arm for the UK. So we've had a, a collaborative project with Singapore um, with some really good outputs. So yeah, but there is a way to, to get this out there. So I think Gary wants to add to that. Yeah, so so before COVID, we weren't here. So we were, so Ian uh, and myself are both based in China, uh, but we have a business in Australia, which is, um, uh, Tasmania is uh, one of the places we're looking at to manufacture. We have a business in America, in Portland, Oregon. Um, so multinational, we don't care. But the, when you get grant funding, there's two things. First of all, you do want to represent um, UK PLC. So there are, there's great interest in, in doing work overseas. But the reality also is we want to be the Silicon Valley of, of technology. And so you have to be very careful then and make sure you've got patents and things in place before you go overseas too much. Um, from an internship viewpoint and um, you know, staff, we're probably about 50-50. We've got 14 interns this year, seven are from overseas and seven are from the UK. So hope that got some of the, some of the answers. Super. Okay, one more in the room. So Peter Crossley, University of Exeter. I guess my, my concern always is, is it economically sensible to produce the hydrogen locally in the Southwest or to produce it nationally or to import it from Saudi Arabia or Oman instead of importing natural gas? So are we going to just shift to being Britain, you know, that big slide at the beginning was showing Britain as an energy exporter? We actually haven't been an energy exporter for quite a long time now. Okay, we had a, 20 years with oil and gas from the North Sea, then it disappeared. Are we going to import most of our energy? Um, well, but I might take that. I'm going to take some of that question. Um, I think what's key here is, is, is renewable energy. And then converting that renewable energy into into a product into green hydrogen. So that's really that's the you know if you're importing anything and it's not renewable, you've got obviously got the shipping costs, storage costs, and all those things. So I think from my point of view, using something, producing it locally, and using it locally is usually uh, a, a good approach. 
So, but I'm not an energy expert and I'm not going to answer your question any further. Anyone else want to take this one? <laughs> Gary. So, so, so here's, yeah, so Ian's bringing up security as an issue. If we allow ourselves to buy green hydrogen from anywhere other than the UK, then we're going to have the same problem in the future with energy security. But think about this one. Um, the, the places with the most sun mostly have the least water. And what's hydrogen made out of? Water. So when you talk about Saudi Arabia being the capital of green hydrogen production, they've first got to clean the water. They've got to desalinate it and do lots of other things. If we can't make it cheaper here, then shame on us. The biggest problem is, is that for the fuel to be sold, it's four pound a kilo is what uh, element two would like to buy it at. And it currently costs about six pound a kilo to make. And if you add some profit into that and get, some, get your money back, we've got to be uh, somehow subsidizing that difference in uh, contract. So I'd love it to be, my own opinion would be, I'd love from a security viewpoint just to be standalone. But we can, we can do like we did when we were buying coal. You can buy some of it cheaply from overseas, then fine, buy it cheaply from overseas. But I don't think we should follow the German model and have all of our um, energy reliant on pipelines and things from other countries, which is my opinion. No, that's great. Thank you, Gary, um, filling in the gaps. And uh, anyone else before? I th One for Ian. One for Ian? Yeah. Um, the, uh... You mentioned about the northeast of England. I'm actually from the northeast and from Durham. Um, and uh, the trials you're having up there and everything's running smoothly. And you mentioned the southwest. And you sort of, there was a bit of rhetoric. Uh, what's the word? I've been away a long time, so English is not my, my strong point. But you, yeah, the, the, you were hesitant, let's say, about the southwest. And I just wondered what the problems were with. You know, you would have thought they want to grasp that, you know, your ideas and, 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 and move you forward as fast as possible. But, but they didn't seem to want to do that. Why is that? I think it's basically um, stimulate the party. Uh, I think it will catch up. Um, Just on. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it will catch up. Um, it's um, we've found it quite difficult to get funding in the southwest. I have to be quite honest about it. Our biggest problem is obviously we the we're part of the Nebi Group, and um, because um, we're not a, a small medium manufacturer, um, obviously we don't qualify for um, funding from Innovate UK, um, which is obviously a big issue for us. Um, the problem is is that we are we're all standalone companies within the group. So we're all self-funding companies within the group. We're not, we're not run from one big pot. Um, and um, there is an awful lot of interest. We've had meetings with the Earl of Devon. Um, we've had meetings with local council. And we're working, working with the Southwest Business, uh, Southwest Business Council at the moment. Uh, and they are opening the right doors for us. We're just about to join the all, par the all parliamentary um, committee for hydrogen as well. Um, to obviously get our name known there. Uh, but it, we have found it quite difficult. It has been quite open. Scottish gas networks, northern gas networks have been um, quite uh, at the forefront of investing in um, this technology and supporting businesses uh, in able to do this. Uh, and um, Wales and West are, are sort of now um, coming on board and have had meetings with us as well. Um, but it's just a case of pushing a lot harder down here at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I think that was our last question, unfortunately, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, speakers, um, we'll meet back up the hub in a minute and uh, have a little debrief. Uh, technicians, welcome. Um, thanks again for being here and listening to everyone talk and myself. Thanks for coming so far as well, Holly. That's really, really kind of you. Um, thanks to everyone online. There's about 40 participants online also. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much the end of the session. But um, thanks again. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Bye-bye.